A top story this hour, suspended SARS Commissioner Tom Moyane is expected to testify the inquiry probing governance issues at the revenue services. Explosive claims of the rogue unit and meddling in a VIP tax affairs emerged this week, and former employees told the inquiry that a culture of fear and mistrust prevailed at the institution under Moyane and Jonas Makwagwa's administration. Moyane was initially not scheduled to appear before the commission, but requested a right of reply to the judge following damning allegations leveled against him. Makwakwa has reportedly also asked to testify. The inquiry is meant to end today with the final report uh, being presented to the president in November. And we cross live to the proceedings. The following topics. One, the failure to invite the commissioner. Two, eliciting evidence adverse to the commissioner's rights without giving him an opportunity to rebut it. Three, the choice of witnesses. And four, facing two inquiries by the same person, the president, with the same principal witness, Godan, into the same or an overlapping subject matter. As I've said, fairness, there's no one-size-fits-all uh, definition of fairness. Starting with the first topic, failure to invite Commissioner Mayan. Although it is clear by now that uh, Commissioner Mayane and his term of leadership between 20, from 2014 to date, in fact that is spelled out in the terms of reference, is the core issue of this commission, this commission did not see it fit to, to uh, interact with him in any way, save, save to the unsatisfactory extent of the courtesy letter for which we are uh, grateful. By the mere fact that contacting Mabuza attorneys, by the mere fact of contacting Mabuza attorneys, this commission showed that it was fully aware of the ongoing disciplinary proceedings conducted under the auspices of the president and or Mr. Kodan. To pretend otherwise would be strange and unsustainable. The short notice given to Commissioner Mayana is, uh, in any event, grossly unfair, given the gravity of the issues and the allegations made against him daily in this room. And we say the failure to invite Commissioner Mayana is on its own unfair and unlawful and an unlawful violation of his rights to defend himself. Again, uh, just a co one doesn't need to be a lawyer to understand the fact that if serious allegations are going to be made against you, you at the very least have to be there you at the very least have to have a right to report those allegations, and at the very least you must uh, be given your, to hear your side of the story. It's cold comfort with respect, Judge, to do what you suggested in your opening remarks, that at some time in the future uh, you, will, you may be uh, called to make a statement. The point of the matter is that at the time when the adverse statements are being made against you, when predictably certain attitudes are being uh, planted in the minds of the public, that is the time to exercise your rights to fairness, not in some future unspecified date. Um, then we go to eliciting evidence adverse to Moyane's rights without giving him an opportunity to rebut. Uh, that's what I've partly covered, so I won't read that section as it is. Um, we've said that uh, that the, the same treatment has incidentally been meted out to advocates Kakana SC, whose commission report has been rubbished here four years after its release by persons who have never taken the report on review. That is patently unfair. Of all the lies told here in the past few days, the biggest is that the rogue unit does not or did not ex exist, and that Advocate Kakana's findings ought to be discredited once again without even giving him an opportunity to, to defend his report. The truth, of course, is that the rogue unit existed under Minister Kodan, and to his knowledge, it was in fact uh, reported to him in October 2000, 2007, I think, the, its, its institution. 
In this respect, Commissioner Mayane hereby hands over a memory stick containing a recording which puts the matter beyond any doubt. It will be left to the Commission to decide whether to release it to the public, which we propose should be done. This Commission also must also take, uh, obtain transcripts of the evidence given under oath before Skakana inquiry by some of the implicated characters who have testified here. Incidentally, it has been established independently by me at least that these characters refused to testify before the ongoing KPMG inquiry chaired by Advocate Zabeza SC on the grounds that they are still facing criminal prosecution. They have, however, been keen to testify before this particular inquiry. And we suggest that the, reins, the reasons must be that, having been recognized pre and uh, consulted with, they were of the view that uh, here they will not face robust questioning and uh, will receive sweetheart and kid gloves treatment. <coughs> because there can be no reasons why they would uh, object to going to a proper inquiry and then Sabeza, but be so overly keen to rush here. Then we go to the question of choice of witnesses. Well, we say the witness list makes very interesting and curious reading. It suggests that there was an earlier, there was an earlier evidence gathering stage to determine the alleged relevance of the evidence and also some witness preparation. We will, I'm sure our colleagues will correct us if we are wrong about that. It is, for example, unlikely that Mr. Godin simply woke up on 26 June and produced a 140-page presentation. And uh, the aesthetics alone of Mr. Godin being the leading light in both the inquiry, disciplinary inquiry and this one, uh, speak for itself. The witnesses are all persons who are disgruntled, some for very well-known reasons which might become clear when the, the material we have donated to the Commission be, is, is listened to. We said the hostility, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? No, I was saying, the, I'm, I'm just developing paragraph 36. Yes, just I was saying that might become clearer when uh, the, the uh, material in the memory stick is considered. The hostility of the principal witness and architect of this process, Mr. Kodan, towards Commissioner Moyana is also well known, and that the, this commission would be uh, hard pressed to deny knowledge thereof. Everybody knows about this. Members of the rogue unit have also have a huge axe to grind with Commissioner Moyana, and so would any other employee who, rightly or wrongly, regards himself or herself as a victim of the imaginary Moya Nepaj. Choice of witnesses exhibits that the Commission has prejudged the issue before it and is merely going through the motions to reach a predetermined outcome, which would be patently unlawful. And no amount of uh, timid questioning uh, can uh, mask that fact. Next, we talk about the facing, the, a very important issue, facing two inquiries by the same person with the same principal witness into the same or overlapping subject matter. It is a trite principle of our law and the common law rules of fairness and justice that a person, one, cannot face two separate tribunals which are destined to return separate verdicts, findings or rulings on the same subject matter. The underlying principle finds expression in the maxim of lease pendants or lease alibi pendants. It's also tried that a person cannot be tried twice for the same offense, and the underlying principle is so-called double jeopardy. The overlaps between these two inquiries is itself evident, and I won't go through the, each terms of reference to isolate those, but uh, one can think off the top of my head of issues, for example, to do with uh, the VAT not reporting matters to the minister and so on, but there are quite a few overlaps. 
It is indeed so that, in addition, one of those two reasons uh, originally cited by the president for his alleged loss of confidence, namely the vet returns, miraculously did not appear in the charge sheet only to resurface in this commission. The inference of an unlawfully orchestrated double-barreled attack on the commissioner is in the circumstances irresistible. One simply has to imagine the possibility of the two processes reporting two different outcomes to the same president to demonstrate the inherent absurdity in the present situation. The idea of facing two kangaroo courts at the same time on the same subject simply needs to be stated to be rejected. And before I, I quote that um, uh, extract, I simply want to say, just to make this example, let's assume for argument's sake that this commission finds that Mr. Moyane is innocent, or it finds that Mr. Moyane is guilty, either way. And then the following day, he must go to an inquiry under a BAM SC to determine his guilt or innocence. Theoretically, it's possible that he might be found innocent here and guilty there, or guilty there and innocent here. The permutations are endless. But uh, that would show even to a, a child the absurdity of, or rather the rationale for the rule that you should not face two inquiries at the same time about the same thing. The principle is also related to raised judicata, which I won't elaborate, that's just legal stuff. Nafsa J explained the basics in this of the principle as follows in the Supreme Court of Appeal. He said, quote, it is necessary to consider the underlying principle of the defense of least alibi pendants. In that case of Naisley, this court stated the following, quote, the defense of least alibi pendants shares features in common with the defense of race judicata because they have a common underlying principle, which is that there should be finality in litigation. Once a suit has been commenced before a tribunal that is competent to adjudicate upon it, the suit must generally be brought to its conclusion before the tribunal and should not be replicated, least alibi pendants. By the same token, the suit will not be permitted to revive once it has been brought to its proper conclusion, res judicata. The same suit between the same, jury, same parties should be brought once and finally. This principle has been stated and repeated by the authorities over a period of more than a century. Double jeopardy is also a time-tested principle of fairness and justice, according to which, once found not guilty, or, li or liable in one set of proceedings, a person may not be subjected to a process to determine the same liability. Again, it would be easy to postulate that situation arising here if both processes are allowed to continue. I've already made the examples. We then say, if necessary, an exercise to demonstrate the commonality of the issues to be determined will be performed, in other words, in the two inquiries, will be performed with reference to the documents referred to above, and if necessary, the Godan affidavit in the disciplinary inquiry will be provided to the Commission. I have a copy here, but we just didn't make a copy. It's quite long. So it, it, if the Commission is interested in it, we will supply it. In this regard, additional factors to be considered include the inconvenience and financial burden being prejudicially placed upon Commissioner Moyane, and the looming possibility of a fruitless waste of taxpayers' money in meaningless proceedings, which are doomed from the start and will be mutually destructive, as I have explained. It is uh, Mr. Moyane's considered view that the whole ent enterprise viewed in totality is just an unmitigated sham and a fuss. Then we deal with bias. <coughs> as far as bias, maybe before I move to bias, let me explain what we are saying there. And it is that there's a danger of each of the processes being undermined by the other, so to speak, and that uh, that might taint or contaminate uh, irreparably both processes, unless a solution is found to the uh, double jeopardy or uh, least pendants situation that is currently prevailing. 
that's quite apart from just the sheer unfairness of expecting Mr. Moyane to be uh, running around literally. In theory, these things could even be happening on the same day, at some future date. So he would, he might be expected to come here and listen to uh, the uh, unstopping uh, allegations and uh, his name being rubbished, and at the same time, uh, Palm SC process could be continuing down the road. Again, one doesn't have to be a lawyer to realize the absurdity of that situation. Um, now, we deal with bias. Bias, of course, the church will know, is itself a, 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 a factor of fairness, but it's a standalone, uh, we deal with it as a standalone heading. For example, the question of the selection of witnesses might exhibit bias, a certain bias, but it also is a, an issue under fairness itself. <clears throat> then we go to the question of the conflict of interest, which is a subject of bias. We say a specific issue which deals with the reasonably perceived or apprehended bias on the part of Mr. Moyane is the choice of commissioners by the president. It is common cause that the president, and to some extent Mr. Godin, is the main adversary of Commissioner Moyane in the disciplinary inquiry. He and uh, uh, Godin as well are essential witnesses, or at least have put themselves in positions where they'll be essential witnesses. It is also not expected to be denied, and I'm sorry that he's not here, that Professor Michael Katz has habitually acted over the years to date in previous and pending proceedings for Mr. Ramaphosa. For example, the pending civil proceedings in which Mr. Ramaphosa is being sued by the victims of Marikana in his personal uh, in his personal capacity. Sorry, it shouldn't say circumstances, it should be capacity. Which had to be disclosed to Mr. Moyan. Other past and present instructions in respect of personal and or private businesses, business dealings may or may not have been in the public domain. The two gentlemen are known to be personal friends who have likely visited each other's homes. It would be interesting to find out if these relationships were even disclosed to this commission. If so, a copy thereof will be requested. As the old adage says, justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. The test is, of course, not actual bias, but a reasonable apprehension or suspicion thereof on the part of a potentially prejudiced party, such as Commissioner Moyan. The president could surely have appointed a person who is uh, who is not well known to be his personal lawyer, so as to sustain a semblance of neutrality or impartiality. By going outside and even appointing a retired judge, albeit to perform an administrative and executive function, he wanted to communicate or convey to the outside world that the commission is impartial and free of conflicts or the propensity to be better disposed towards a particular outcome desired by the president. Such, such conduct of appointing a, a, a conflicted person amounts to nothing but an abuse of power, which is also done in bad faith. The principle underlying this particular objection is nemo judex in, in causa sua, which simply means no one should be a judge in his or her own case. In this case, obviously, that would extend to your, not just to yourself, but to your attorney or, or your agent of some sort. So I should add here, not, it applies not only to my, the attorney, but to me as well. No, no, uh, absolutely not. you said that. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I was saying, no, I was making an example. I was simply saying, Judge, the, the, the mere appointment of a judge like yourself is meant to communicate uh, that th this is supposed to be an independent and impartial uh, body. Otherwise, they should have just done an internal. You said, yeah, and of course, you said it's not. No, absolutely. I'm saying it's not because of cuts. Yes.
No, no, you're saying it's not. The appointment of a judge is to give the impression that it is independent. Yes. But you say, in fact, it is not independent. No, no. Or I am no. not independent. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying, Judge. I'm saying that the, the, the mere appointment of a judge, which happens in all the, the commissions, is meant to assure the public. Because, remember, a commission is just an extension. Just finish that sentence, to assure the public? To assure the public that there is uh, independence, right? Now, I'm saying... If you say that it doesn't assure the public because the judge is not independent. No, 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 no. Judge, uh, I'll tell you, uh, if, if we, when we have a problem we'll with you... We'll come back to that. Well, when we have a problem with you, you can be assured that we will, we will tell you uh, <laughs> uh, without any fear or favor. What I'm saying is simply this, that the, the, the appointment of a compromised person, let's say for the, for the purposes of this argument that Mr. Katz is... is uh, compromised. If you appoint such a person together with a neutral judge, then you are just giving us mixed messages yes. because uh, the, your original intention was to convey uh, neutrality. So it, 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 uh, uh, it doesn't uh, refer to, to the judge. And in any event, I must add this, by the way, that we do have other concerns even regarding the other commissioners. Uh, no, but not yourself, but we, we decided not to raise those at this stage and just raise the most yes. obvious case and the most uh, egregious violation of Mr. Moyana's rights. Um, and so w when we use the Nemo Udex in Causa Sua principal judge, just to be so that there's no debate about this, it it's refers specifically to Mr. Michael Katz as an extension of Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, in other words, as his attorney. So he's judging his own case, obviously not literally, but uh, as, as, as a person who acts for that person. Uh, let me make this example. If, of course, and I must preface this by saying we know this is not a court of law or anything like that, but just to illustrate the point, what we're saying is that, let's say for argument's sake, Professor Katz was appointed to act as a judge in the High Court. His uh, professional and ethical duty, if one of his clients happened to be a litigant while he was acting as a judge, would be for him to recuse himself. And we're saying uh, similarly here, in a process which is uh, intended to be impartial and independent, he should similarly recuse himself. For, uh, because the principle is the same. It obviously applies with much more force in a court setting. But uh, the, the independence is independence, whether you are in a court or in a disciplinary hearing or whatever. You can have two types of independence, one for court and one for commissions of inquiry. And then we say generally and legally speaking, it should be self-evident that all the rights above uh, invoke both the legitimate expectations of commissioner for, for procedural fairness and also affects the rights of the public. This is just an aside. Accordingly, at the appropriate stage, both, both sections three and four of PAJA will be of relevance. Rationality and the rule of law will also be at play and uh, play a clear role. <laughs> okay, I, I don't want to get so much into legalese, but uh, I, all we're saying there is that there are principles uh, by which the state is bound uh, to act. And it is self-evident that this commission is not just about the issues outlined in the terms of reference. But as the judge correctly pointed out earlier, it's, it's really about all of us. It's a matter that affects the economy, the public, and it's a matter that is probably of the utmost public interest because tax collection is at the heart of any, the existence of any nation. Then we deal with um, the, what we seek to happen finally. We say in view of the above, the, the Commissioner of SARS seeks the following relief or rulings from your charge. A, one is a discontinuation of this commission, alternatively, a stay of its proceedings 
pending the outcome of the disciplinary inquiry. If I may pause there, the, again, uh, when I make these examples, I don't want to be taken literally. So when I talk about list pendants, it's, it's obviously, I'm, I'm saying this is a situation akin to that. But in any event, the judge knows very well that in the, one of the principles of list pendants is that if there are those two proceedings, parallel proceedings, so to speak, then it is the later proceedings that, that are usually stayed. But obviously that's a matter that's in the discretion of a court and hopefully we will not get there. Uh, it might well be that for practical reasons it's the other one that should be that should be stayed, but that's a matter that can be debated at leisure at a later stage. The point <coughs> remains that you cannot expect fairness when a person is facing two inquiries over the same subject matter, which might come to different results. And we also say that all the evidence of the past three days must be expunged from the record as it was obtained under a huge cloud of unlawfulness and procedural unfairness, particularly in the absence of the person who has clearly become the dramatic persona, persona of these proceedings, which are now being called the Moyane Commission, for good reason. We also ask for the recusal of Professor Katz as a member of the panel of commissioners for the reasons outlined. And we also ask for an undertaking, this was confer, uh, rather contained in our letter, an undertaking that this commission will not entertain or hear evidence relating to any subject matter or issue which forms part of the disciplinary inquiry. The reasons for this have also been explained extensively. And five, we ask for a directive that SARS must provide the necessary legal assistance to the commissioner to exercise his rights, which have hitherto been violated at this commission. And let me just pause there again. There is no doubt, uh, Judge Nugent, that uh, but for the suspension of Mr. Moyan, if your commission was, uh, as it obviously is, about uh, investigating into his tenure, 2014 to date, at SARS. If he was upstairs and working here, uh, one of the people one would think or hope that he would want to hear from would have been him, because it is under him, under his stewardship, that all these allegations happen. The only reason we suspect that that was not done is because he's now suspended. Now that suspension should be irrelevant for your purposes. It should not play any role in your mind. You should treat him as the commissioner of SARS, which is what he is. Until such time that he is dismissed, uh, which is unlikely to happen uh, given the shambles of that other process. Uh, the Assumption must be that he's presumed to be innocent and that on any day now he might walk back into his office. So why should he be treated differently now simply because he's suspended than he would have been but for that suspension? Again, the unfairness of that approach of looking at him with a jaundiced eye simply because of his suspension and when he has not been found guilty of anything and treating him differently is blatant for all to see. Um, and of course, the likes of Minister Gordon uh, come here, quite frankly, uh, in, in, you know, during a time where he should be minding public enterprises. And in, in a way, which it's, it's sponsored uh, by the state. And yet Mr. Mariana must face two proceedings, uh, you know, all on his own against the mighty state of South Africa, its president, and the likes of Mr. Kodan, who evidently hates him. We therefore humbly request uh, to be furnished with reasons for any ruling made in response to our submissions. And uh, we would like to 
really uh, uh, plead with this commission that it takes these uh, concerns to heart because they come from a place of pain when just imagine if it was you or your acquaintance or your son or your daughter whose name is bended about on a daily basis on television and in newspapers without any opportunity uh, to refute and while in jeopardy of the same issues coming before a disciplinary inquiry. In this new dispensation, we need a bit of empathy, Judge, and empathy means putting yourself into someone else's shoes. So let's assume for a minute that all the terrible things that are being said here about Mr. Moyane are true. Let's assume. He's the worst manager, he ran a reign of terror, he, he fired 500 people, whatever. Let's just assume it's all true. That's not what we're addressing. We're addressing the fairness or otherwise of all those allegations being made against him without him having an opportunity uh, to face his accusers. All these people who were allegedly tormented by Mr. Moyane must come here and say all these things while their tormentor is sitting and watching television and not able to answer for himself. If that is justice under this so-called new South Africa, well then I don't know what justice means. That is an abuse of power, it's an abuse of justice, it's an abuse of the money of the state, it's an abuse of positions that people have acquired uh, which they use willy-nilly to wake up and just appoint a commission simply to whitewash and, uh, and uh, to make, to glorify their own terms of office with lies and uh, untruths. It cannot be allowed to continue, Judge. We, 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 we really would like you to approach this from a, 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 a position of impartiality which we know you for and uh, to, as we say, to apply it with a little bit of empathy and, um, and an understanding of where we're coming from. This is an abuse, it's a sham, it's a farce, and uh, it cannot be allowed to continue. If people want to indicate that they are now back in power, um, in the like the Hollywood style uh, encounter which happened on the 15th of November 2014 well then they must use their own money they mustn't use the taxpayers money to glorify themselves or to run the country by remote control so th that in, in a nutshell is, uh, is, is, is what we've come here for Obviously, we, uh, Commissioner Moyane is making this submission so that they, it can be resolved, I wouldn't say amicably, but uh, in, in good time before the damage which is being done here, literally every minute this uh, commission is sitting can, can go very far. The, Judge, I must just say thank you very much for giving us the hearing and uh, giving us the opportunity when we requested to come here you did not hesitate to give us an opportunity and again i'm sure that was motivated by the knowledge that uh, mr moyane is obviously at the center of these proceedings we will be ready to take any if i may just check with my team if there's anything Yes, no, we, we, we are in possession of, of certain uh, forms of, of, of evidence to back up some of the claims that we make, but 
uh, I think it would be more, more appropriate to supply that to the evidence leaders uh, because I have not myself had time to look at it. And Do I see them all? How many yes. are there? No, of course, yes. Well, one. The, the first, the, 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 the loose page document, Judge, the, let's start with the easy one. The loose page document simply outlines uh, what I called uh, the, the GDP, text to GDP ratio. Uh, it's, a, it's a table of all the years, starting from the Gordon years to the Moyane years, where you will see the improvements uh, which followed from the operating model. The other one is evidence of some of the uh, grotesque equipment which was used by the rogue unit to violate the rights of citizens. And I might mention, we, we will give it to the, no, we'll, uh, Eric, we'll give it later to the evidence. Uh, uh, no, you, they can look at it obviously now, but we'll make, we'll make copies. Yes. Make copies. Yes. <laughs> And I, I just wanted to say just that uh, the, the so-called uh, activities of the rogue unit, there, there is, oh, I think we made that point, that uh, we, are, we understand that there is a, a transcript of evidence given to Sikakane, the Sikakane Commission under oath by persons who have give, come here under oath again and given a different testimony. One of those versions must be lies and we will we will also try as much as we can mr moyane just to close off on this question of the rogue unit if and when the time comes will tell you that the when he arrived in at his office he found the files of individual taxpayers uh, prominent politicians, pr prominent sports administrators, prominent business people, which he immediately dispatched to where they should be because he did not think that in the SARS commissioner's office it would be proper to have uh, files of prominent politicians. Uh, and so those are some of the abuses that he, he cleaned up and for which he has obviously become unpopular. Thank you. Mr. Mpofu, let me just say at the beginning that I've heard a lot about pain in the last three days. And I will deal with all of that pain empathetically. Thank you. Whether it is your clients or witnesses who might be telling the truth or might not be telling the truth. So we've heard a lot about pain. But let me add this. You said if, we, if you have a problem with me, you will raise it in no uncertain terms. Absolutely. I think you have already. No, I haven't. Well, I, can I now please let me finish okay. now. I've listened to you without interruption. Thank you, thank you. I have never been called a kangaroo court before. Yeah. Now, um, you know that under the, uh, the Commissions Act, it is an offence to disparage a commission. Yes. But let me tell you, Mr. Mpofo, I've got a thick skin. So don't worry about that. I wouldn't institute any prosecution for disparity. Yes. But what does strike me as we went through this is how, how, how loose it is with, with the facts. And I'd like to just take you through this and just raise what seemed to me to be problems with the facts. Thank you. But the first thing I think that you don't understand, <clears throat> perhaps you have read the proclamation which established this commission, or perhaps you haven't. Let me read it to you. In terms of Section 84.2F of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa of 1996, I hereby appoint a commission of inquiry into tax administration and governance by the South African Revenue Service with the terms of reference attached here to, and appoint the former judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal who has been discharged from active service, Honorable Mr. Justice Robert Nugent, as Commissioner assisted by Mr. Michael Katz, Advocate Mabongi Masilo, and Mr. Voyo Dominic Kashler. Do you notice that who the commission is? I am the commissioner. Yeah. I am the commission. I am assisted by those two. 
Now, throughout here, you've talked about, for example, Mr. Katz as being a member of the Commission. He's not a member of the Commission. I am the Commission, solely. Oh. As you will see as well from the regulations also published under the hand of the President. So I think that that's an error that I'd like to just correct. And that is why I'm sitting alone today. Yes. To no, no, no. You can answer anything. In the make end. A, make okay. a note. That's what I, I wanted to know, yeah. Yes. Oh. Now, that's what we deal with, first of all, at paragraph 10, where you say that uh, the panel of commissioners consists of retired Judge Robert Nugent, Professor Michael Katz, uh, Mr. Koshler, and, and Advocate Masila. As far as the <coughs> we go to paragraph 14. One. You have it? Got it. One four. Yes. Yes. On the 28th of June 2018, <coughs> Judge Nugent eventually confirmed that Commissioner Moyani would be given audience at 9:30 on the following day, the 29th, as per his request, dated the 22nd of June. Now that gives the impression it took me six days to give him this opportunity the day before today. Yes. Can we just go through the correspondence that has passed between us? I'm sure that your attorney has it. If he I've does. got it in my head. Right. On Wednesday, the 20th of June, 2018, at 9.33 in the morning, I sent a letter to Mr. Mabuza reading as follows. I understand you are the attorney of the Commissioner of the South African Rev Revenue Service, Mr. T. Moyani. I write to inform you, for your information and as a courtesy to your client, that the Commission of Inquiry will be hearing evidence in public from 26 to 29 June 2018, commencing at 2 o'clock on 26 June 2018 at the following venue. That was follow that was responded to by your attorney on Friday, June the twenty second. I'm going to read the whole letter again. Thank you very much for your letter dated twenty june twenty eighteen, in which you advise Commissioner Moyani as a courtesy of the impending hearings of your Commission of Inquiry next week. Due inter alia to the short notice, it is not possible to attend the hearings in full. However, our client deems it necessary to request an opportunity to address the Commission hearings in order, inter alia, to place certain issues on the re record and, where necessary, to seek certain rulings. Such issues include, but may, but may not be limited to, raising an objection against the suitability of Professor Michael Katz, and I won't finish that paragraph. Secondly, seeking an undertaking from the Commission that it will stay clear of dealing with any issue, which is the subject matter of the pending disputes which have been placed before the disciplinary inquiry chaired by Advocate Azab Barmesi, so as to avoid double jeopardy and manifest unfairness, expressing our client's interest in participating in and cooperating with your commission and attending to the practical arrangements for doing so in his capacity as the current commissioner of SARS. We would appreciate it if an arrangement can be reached for our client to make submissions in respect of the above issues, preferably on the 29th of June. Note the 29th of June, it is today, at your commencement time. I think there are two things one should note from this. Number one, you asked, your attorney asked on the 22nd of June for an opportunity to speak to us today. That is a week later. Now, that's the second thing, is you sought an opportunity not to give evidence, but to address these objections to us. There's no request here for evidence to be given. You know no, that. No, there isn't. Nobody said there is. Now, why do I, my papers always get mixed up? On the 23rd of June, which is the next day, 
I wrote to Mr. Mabuza as follows. I have noted the contents of your letter of Friday, 22 June 2018. Note that the hearings commence on Tuesday the 26th and not the 29th. You are invited to make any submissions on behalf of your client at 10.30 on Tuesday the 26th, June at the venue indicated in my earlier letter. You'll see I, I, my, I was under the impression there that your, client, your attorney had got the date wrong. He said it's 26th, not the 29th. That was replied to at 11.07 on Monday, June the 25th by your attorney. Thank you for your letter dated 23 June 2018, in which you invite us to make submissions at 10.30 on Tuesday the 26th of June. Unfortunately, due to the short notice and our other pressing commitments, we will only be able to attend the hearings on the 29th of June 2018, all our clients' rights are reserved. Now, you'll note two things from this. Number one, your attorney chose to come and present your submissions today, which was after the evidence has been heard. Not before the evidence was heard, but after the evidence has been heard. Chose. And the reason, according to this letter, is that he had short notice, well, a week is not particularly short notice, to present representations on the three issues that I've mentioned. Should Professor Katz be here? Should I give an undertaking? Uh, and what would I can't remember the third one. A week is not long for that, Mr. Mforfo. You've been a counsel for a long time, and I was as well. We can do things like that in a day. Thirdly, one of the reasons for, uh, for, for not doing that is that your attorney had other pressing commitments. Now, if your attorney feels he wishes to attend to his other pressing commitments rather than come here, he's welcome to do so, but don't blame me. There are also, by the way, a thousand and more counsel at the bar, any one of whom, I'm sure, you would easily find one to come here. I'm sure that you are not available because I know that you are very busy, but there are many counsel who could come here. On the uh, 25th of June at 11 o'clock in the morning, I wrote to Mr. Mabuza, I note your response. For the moment, will you anticipate that I will hear you at 9 o'clock on the 29th? But I will confirm that in the course of the week. I wasn't quite sure then when, whether, what time we would be starting. Um, the, uh, uh, the response is, is rather surpri surprising. It's at 5.31 p.m. on June the 27th, which June the 27th, which is two days before uh, this was going to be heard. We refer to your email dated the 23rd of June 2018. We have made certain arrangements to make an appearance at the hearing on Friday at 9, as you indicated in your email, subject to confirmation. Your failure and or delay to confirm at this late hour the time is prejudicial to us in that we need to prepare for such an appearance and to keep counsel available, which can obviously not be done overnight. Well, in my day, one could do it overnight, but things have changed now. Though. But the point I make is that your, 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 your attorney says it's prejudicial to you that you are told that you need to come half an hour later, not half an hour earlier even, half an hour later, which gives you the extra half an hour, you'll understand the point. But that, he says, uh, that my failure to confirm the time is prejudicial. Well, if half an hour is prejudicial, then it is prejudicial. But we must just get the facts correct. Um, on the 28th of June at 6.58 a.m. I'm sorry. On 28th of June, 2018 at 6.58 in the morning. Dear Mr. Babuza, I wrote to him, my apology for the delay. You may advance submissions on behalf of your client on Friday morning, 29th of June. We will be commencing half an hour later than originally envisaged, uh, advised at 9.30. And that's where the correspondence ends. Now, I think I may be wrong, but you may wish to reconsider uh, 
whether before paragraph 14, which reads, on the 28th of June, Judge Nugent eventually confirmed that he would be given an audience as per his request, might need to be amended to include what had happened before that. You might wish to just consider that. I'll leave it with you at the moment. Now, on paragraph 15, in the short space available, Commissioner Moyani consulted with his legal representatives in order to produce the submission, which had to be done overnight due to the enormously short notice. Now, I understand from that that you must have done that last night. Now, you were given, told a week before that there would be public hearings. Uh, on which date, you, your attorney asked on the 22nd of June, a week ago, to be given a hearing. He was told the day after, that's six days, you are invited to make any submissions, yet it was the submissions were written overnight. Anyway, let's yeah. look at that. Do you see the difficulty I have with that paragraph? No. You don't see it? Okay, we will come back make a note. What Mr. Godin did, was, did not explain is how he came to be the first witness to be called. <coughs> well, Mr. Godin <coughs> would not, not know that. I would know that, and uh, the uh, advocates assisting me would know that. How he happens to be in possession of documents, well, not sure that that's a particular big issue, but there it is. <coughs> now, thereafter you give a lot of facts of what the true position is. And it might well be the true position, and it might not be the true position. But this commission will be continuing until the end of November. It is now three days into the, into the hearing of evidence. There have been two or three weeks of inquiries made beforehand. Your client, if he wishes to have an opportunity to be heard, will be heard. You need have no concern on that score. It is we have until November for him to be heard. I see no reason why he should be heard now, but you will tell me why he should be heard now. And may I just suggest to you, you will of course advise him, but I suggest to you that it might be a lot more uh, in the interest of your client to give evidence once he's heard everything that has been said against him and prepared properly, and he will then be able to respond to it. In my view, but it is not my view that will prevail, it is far more prejudicial to a witness to give evidence after each witness, not knowing what other evidence is coming. It is a very dangerous practice, as I found in my practice. <clears throat> You talk about what the media has reported, etc. A few examples are given. I don't choose what the media reports. The media must do its business and I will do my business. If the media gets it wrong, if they embellish at times, if they give sensational headlines, well, that's up to them. And to tell you the truth, I hardly ever read the media and make a point of not doing so as far as possible when I'm in a case that is reported in the media. <clears throat> All this is occurring, you say, in a situation where Commissioner Muyani has not been invited to the Commission or been contacted by the evidence leaders, as appears to have been the case. Undoubtedly, he has not been contact, uh, contact, uh, contacted. This Commission was appointed four weeks ago. You will see from its terms of reference that they are extensive. There is no reason why Mr. Moyani should be the prime person to be spoken to first. We will speak to Mr. Moyani if he wishes to be spoken to, but we will speak to him when it is an appropriate time to do so. SARS is a very complex organization. To walk into SARS with terms of reference like this is a daunting task. To walk in and expect that within days or weeks 
One is familiar with how uh, SARS operates, is not possible. Nor is it possible to come to terms with these terms of reference, in which we are asked, incidentally, not only to look at SARS, but we are asked that we are told that the Commission may request the advice or input of the South African Revenue Service, the Davis Tax Committee, the Office of the Tax Ombud, the Financial Intelligence uh, Centre, the South African Reserve Bank. Now, if you want to know why the witnesses who were called as they were called, let me tell you. Because it is no secret, I've told it to the press, the media, time and time again, and if you had been here, you would have heard it. If you look at these terms of reference and you say, well, these are huge, I've got until November to do it. That's what the President told me to do. I said I will do my very best and I am intent on doing so. What one would do, or maybe not what one would do, what others may do it differently, but what I do, and it seems to me that the, the sensible way to go about it, is to look at all these terms of reference and say, where do I start? Now, in Alice in Wonderland, they said you start at the beginning and go through to the end, but that's not the case here. If you look at the beginning of the terms of reference, we must inquire into the adequacy and legality of steps that SARS took or failed to take in the light of revenue shortfalls uh, relative to the budgets, the management of tax and customs settlements to ensure that the settlement process were not compromised, uh, and so forth goes on. Well, that's no point to start. You first need to know about SARS, what is happening in SARS, and get an idea from which you can progress. And what do we know about an organisation such as SARS? We know it is a large organisation with 14,000 people in it. We know that an organization like this operates because of its people and its technology. Those are the two that go hand in hand. The first thing one must look at is its technology and its people before one is in a position even to start. And so one goes to the, what to me was the obvious starting point for our inquiries, and it is this. Paragraph 1.6 of the Terms of Reference. With regard to the reports of the number of senior or experienced SARS employees that have left the employ of SARS since 2014, to inquire into the reasons why they left, whether any employees were coerced in any manner into resigning, whether any severance benefits were paid to those employees, whether there was any obligation to inform the Minister of Finance, etc. It's about employees who had left. And employees who were coerced, whether employees were coerced into any manner, into resigning. Well, the first port of call is to say which employees left or work or resigned during that four year period. And what one does then is one goes to the personnel files with some assistance and you say, let me see the personnel files of the people who left or who were left during that period. And one draws out of that the people that you're concerned with, starting from the top levels, which are the most important. And then one says, well, let me just have a brief talk to these people to get an idea of whether what they say is relevant to this or not. And that is what one does. Uh, Advocate Steinberg, Advocate Sio spoke to some of them, reported to me, yes, they are relevant or not relevant, as the case may be. and suggested that these be called. 